So welcome to lecture 26 of MCS 471 on numerical analysis or for today on numerical integration. So last time in last lecture 25, we introduced interpolation to derive quadrature rules. Uh, today we will see <clears throat> how to apply extrapolation how extrapolation may help to speed up slowly converging compositive trapezoidal rules. So we will start with adaptive integration uh, to see how we can apply the trapezoidal rule step by step. Uh, and then we will see that this often may work very very slowly and actually we experienced that already in the last lecture when we tried to use the composite trapezoidal rule to approximate pi um, so we will solve this now so we do not need a million function evaluations for 10 decimal places uh, we can resolve this by applying romberg integration All right, uh, let's start with the composite trapezoidal rule again. Uh, so here is the trapezoidal rule, which approximates the area under the blue curve by the red trapezoid. So that's why it's called the red, the, the, the trapezoidal rule. So we need two function evaluations at the endpoints of the interval. Uh, and as you can see, that might work. Uh, sometimes we underestimate and uh, sometimes we overestimate. So it's kind of an averaging of the function evaluations. So if you take sufficiently many function evaluations, you may expect to converge to the expected value, which is the integral. Um, so there is a statistic uh interpretation of this well how do we do this uh, step by step well we can obtain a better function a better approximation by taking one extra function evaluation um, the best way to do this if we do not know anything about the shape and form of this function is to take the new function evaluation right in the middle and then we have already an instance of the composite trapezoidal rule with three function evaluations, two sub-intervals of the interval 0, 2. This is actually not really that good. Uh, so let us do the same again. So we are now having four sub-intervals. And with five function evaluations, you can see that we are already getting a more accurate representation for the area under the blue curve. Let's do it one more again, one more time. And now you see actually that the trapezoidal rule from the uh, viewpoint of approximation is actually a piecewise linear approximation of the curve. And here the red pieces actually start to align quite well in the middle uh, with at the middle at least uh, with the blue curve um, so now we have four extra function evaluations for eight sub intervals and nine function evaluations in total so that's the idea of the composite trapezoidal rule applied in an adaptive way. Uh, we are checking whether the approximation we currently have is accurate enough. If that is the case, then we stop subdividing. Otherwise, we continue to divide. So that is the main idea of adaptive integration. 
Uh, we can formulate this now as a problem. Uh, so here we have the composite trapezoidal rule uh, defined for n sub intervals. Um, what is the problem that we have here? So the problem is that uh, we do not know a good a priori value for n. So how large should we take n? In some applications where our function is given by data points, we don't have the choice. But here we are working with a function that we can evaluate as many times as we like. And we are restricted by using the trapezoidal rule. So the problem is actually to turn the formula, the formula for the composite trapezoidal rule, into an iterative algorithm. Um, when do we when the accuracy is good enough, and how do we know uh, when the accuracy is good enough? Well, we can estimate the accuracy by estimating what we called the forward error. We can estimate what we did also with root finding. We estimate the difference between two consecutive approximations. Um, note that and here's something about the hardness of uh, integration. There is no longer a backward error. Uh, so there is actually not really a way to check uh, whether an area is correct or not. Uh, other than trying to do it a little bit more accurately. Um, so that means that these integration problems or any problems that are related to area and volumes, that they are typically a lot, lot harder than the problems that we have covered so far. But we will not go in there. Our problem is a very practical one. Uh, we have a formula, the formula that is on this slide, and we want to turn this in good algorithm. All right, um, if we start with an algorithm, we always define what is the input, what is the output. So on input, we have a function and we have an interval. So an F, an A, and a B. And then we have two parameters uh, that are there with any uh, iterative algorithm. So there is the upper bound on the number of sub-intervals, uh, which is also the upper bound on the number of total function evaluations, uh, pl plus two. So we will do at most n plus one function evaluations here. Um, that's, that's to keep in mind. So the algorithm that is on the slide is actually not really doing this. But uh, we are still only at the second line in the input. So we want an upper number of upper bound on the number of subintervals. That's our first stopping criteria. And then we have a requirement on the accuracy, often also called the tolerance. And what comes out? Uh, what comes out is the um, approximation for the interval, and then also how many subintervals did we compute. Um, if the little n on output equals the capital N, then that may indicate that the accuracy is not reached. All right, so we translate the formula, um, and we start with our plain trapezoidal rule. So T1 uses two function evaluations. And we need T1 in our stopping criteria. So actually, uh, the main step here is that we are uh, having the test on the tolerance. Um, so there's an early exit from this loop. If the two consecutive uh, values for the trapezoidal rule are less than the tolerance, then we return the, the current approximation with the number of subintervals. So the algorithm is a mathematical one. Uh, so we define the step size, uh, also the length of each subinterval as h. And then we apply the plain formula for uh, the for the trapezoidal. So I was saying that the n, the capital N here, is the number of subintervals. That this also is proportional directly 
to the number of function evaluations. So the number of function evaluations is n plus 1. But you see with this formula here, here we do n plus 1 function evaluations. Um, so this algorithm as it is here is correct. It's a mathematical algorithm, but it's not a very efficient one. Um, so we have solved one of the problems. So we do have an, an iterative algorithm. So that will not require us an a priori bound on the number of subintervals. Uh, so we can set that if we are really caring about the accuracy, we can set the capital N really, really high. Uh, higher than a million or a billion, uh, for example, if we really are going after accuracy. However, if you would run this algorithm, you would do in every step, um, so in every step, you actually increase the number of sub-intervals, and you would actually in each step do n plus 1 function evaluations. Um, so also it would be a long algorithm to run. Uh, so actually you do not want a loop with a billion steps. Uh, that's something that you don't really want to do. Um, so that's the other problem. Um, so we also have this N here. Um, that's actually not corresponding to what we did on the pictures. Uh, so what we did on the pictures each time, the current, all the sub-intervals were divided by two. And what we did is we, I said that each time we have a number of new function evaluations. Here actually this algorithm does not take care of. So this is a good iterative algorithm. It follows the specifications that we have seen before, but it is not a practical algorithm. It's not something that you want to run. All right, how do we run it then? Well, we run it as on the pictures. Uh, so each time when you go to the next step, you divide each sub-interval in two. So the increment here, n, suggests that n goes from two, three, four, five. You actually don't do that. You double the n in every step. So here is the picture on where your new function evaluations should be. So we have the initial interval, A, B. We take one point in the middle. So that's another way how you could see the proper way to run the composite rule in an iterative fashion. Each time you take one extra new function evaluation in the middle of every existing interval. And you see that the new number of new function evaluations nevertheless increases. So that's, that's something that uh, makes that uh, the number of iterations, you don't want to do this a billion time year here either. Uh, so it actually increases exponentially. Um, so every time the number of new function evaluations, it doubles. So in order to get one new more accurate approximation, we do the same number of work as in the previous step. Um, so that algorithm will slow down. And why do we do this? Why do we do this in this fashion? Because we want to, in our next approximation, we want to use all the information of all the previous steps. Um, so the algorithm on the previous slide didn't do that. That was actually rather a very wasteful computation. All right, so the distance between the new function evaluations, that actually will also matter because of the h. Uh, so remember we had the h to the power minus 2. Uh, so perhaps I would write this down. So we can actually also, so it is actually not really true that we didn't have a good a priori value. We actually know that the composite trapezoidal rule is expected to have an error of h to the power 2, where the h is the length of every subinterval. And that's actually also the distance between the new function evaluation. 
of course this is uh, expected and we don't know what is the constant in front of this o here in front of the h within the o so the problem is that with this algorithm with, with this bound here we don't really to account the function the shape of the function all right uh, so the problem now is that we have a new algorithm that we have to we, we have to reorganize the new function evaluations differently in going from step size h and step size h divided by two so each time the number of sub intervals are doubles all right here are the formulas so we double the number of intervals uh, so you can see i'm going here from n to 2n so that's the doubling here and everything is now expressed in n so we have h of 2 and h is b minus a divided by n here we have the h sitting in as well so we go from h to h over 2 That's all we do here. Um, so we write down the general formula, and instead of n, we have 2 times n. So it's a, mainly a text substitution. So everywhere where we see n, we write 2n. But now you see that we have a relationship between the two. Uh, the main result of this slide is actually this formula here where we can separate all the old function evaluations but see what happens to the old function evaluations so we have f of a here and we are dividing it by two so compared to so we are dividing it here by 4n instead of dividing it by 2n so uh, this is this constant 1 over 2 that sets here. So this formula says that the next approximation consists of the previous approximation plus an update. So I remember uh, the iterative formulas that we did in the beginning of the course where we worked with delta x. This is here delta t where uh, the t is the exact value of the Zoido rule if we have infinitely many subintervals. So we separate off, all, we could also see it with the even and the odd. If you go from n to 2 times n, then all the old function evaluations have an even index. So what was at index 1 now is at index 2. So it's the same point that you take, but since in the new formula you divide by 2n, not by n, then the i has to be 2 to have the same value in the previous value for 1. So here you can see this formula here. We are taking all the odd i's. Um, so it could be that this is the i is now going back from 1 to n minus 1. But each time we are having the step size. So I should combine the slides here. Let me flip back to the previous slide. Um, and you can see that here's where the distance of the new function evaluations comes in. So the distance between the new function evaluations is actually the length of every interval, it's actually that h again. So this is why the h is also often called the step size. Um, so we have uh, the new function evaluations are marked with these black dots. The new function evaluations are all uh, distance from each other but the h, the b minus a divided by n. So that is the picture. So the picture for this formula is actually on the previous slide. So you see the factor factor that comes in from the previous slide i will mark it now in black because we use big black dots so this is here the 
step size, the H from the previous slide. So all we did was deriving now a new formula, but with this new formula is actually now a new algorithm. Um, and that algorithm is uh, defined uh, in a Julia function. But before we doing that, uh, we have to continue by our other rule uh, with the composite midpoint rule. So we can do uh, the same moves as the last uh, with the composite trapezoidal rule, but now we do it with the composite midpoint rule. What is the point of doing this? Uh, well, here is where the key point is of the first exercise. Each subinterval should be subdivided in D to recycle all the function evaluations. Um, let me try to explain this. So if we have the interval A, B, then we take a new function evaluation in the middle. So that's our existing function evaluation. But we want to recycle that function evaluation. So what I marked here in blue is the function evaluation that we want to recycle. Well, how can we do this uh, if we are dividing intervals? If I would divide the interval in half, then I could not use that blue uh, mark anymore. Instead, I have to subdivide the intervals in three, in three equal subintervals. So what then happens is that in the middle of the interval, the middle interval will have the middle point from the previous step. So I can still recycle that point, and now I have two new, two new ones that are at the left on the right of the existing ones. So that is uh, the justification for step two. Um, so it's an important exercise because it starts to explain why the midpoint rule is not so popular as the trapezoidal rule. If you want to apply the midpoint rule in an adaptive way, you must each time subdividing every subinterval in three. And each time you must take twice as many function evaluations in every step. So in each step to get a more accurate representation for the integral, you must be twice the amount of work. So that is not so good. Um, so in exercise two, you will write the Julia function to do this. And uh, you have this exponential increase in the number of function evaluations. So we kind of mild on the tolerance. Um, so in writing your Julia function, you can actually use the function that we will explain next for the adaptive composite trapezoidal rule. So exercises one and two are important uh, as kind of seeing why one would prefer the trapezoidal rule over the midpoint rule, even though the midpoint rule is the same algebraic degree of precision as the trapezoidal rule. All right, then, uh, all our algorithms are defined by Julia functions. So here is the adaptive trapezoidal rule, uh, adaptive in the sense that the total number of function evaluation is not defined a priori. Um, and we will use this function in what follows with the Romberg integration. So it will not just return a number, but it will return a vector. So what is returned here is a vector of a function evaluations, uh, a vector of approximations. So in every vector, in, in every element in this, every entry in the vector 
accumulates uh, two to the power i function evaluations, where the i is the index. So again, you do not want to put an n equal to 1 million. Uh, if I put here in the example 10, that means that I will do at most 1,025 function evaluations, as 2 to the power n is 1,024. Uh, numerical integration is a very difficult problem. Uh, so that so you see here that I didn't give default values for the tolerances, uh, but we can't really expect uh, quadratic convergence um, in, in, in these simple rules. All right, then here is the function. We start uh, with the simple trapezoidal rule. So the simple trapezoidal rule is over here. And then we have the step sizes. So each time we take a number of function evaluations, so the h is divided by 2. And each time, each time we are uh, taking the function values at the new uh, point. So we then also have our approximations and our stop criterion. Um, so we return uh, the selection of the subinterval. Uh, so it may be that uh, our vector on return is shorter than n. So this is when we reached uh, the accuracy requirement. And here is the main program. Um, so in the Jupyter Notebook, that main program is not there. All you should do is actually then do the function call, eventually with uh, a function that you give as the first argument. All right, here we have the composite uh, trapezoidal rule. Uh, so 1,000 function evaluations. Um, we get, we get, uh, or here we have eight number of iterations. So let me count. So we have step one where we have two function evaluations. Here we have one more uh, function evaluation. Um, so it will be indeed um, the exponential growth of the function evaluations will be at least will be indeed not reach uh, the 1024 because we stop at 8. So this is important here. This 8 is less than the 10. So we have 2 to the power 8, uh, 257 function evaluations for four decimal places of accuracy. So uh, the default tolerance could be 10 to the power minus 4, because with a slow convergence, that is what we may expect. But we are computing with 16 decimal places. And it's also, also always kind of disappointing when with 16 decimal places, we only have half of the available precision. Um, so that's not too good. So let's then come to the main point of uh, the lecture on Berg integration. Um, and that will require extrapolation. So we have covered extrapolation already when we considered Richardson extrapolation. Richardson extrapolation starts from the Taylor series. So with differentiation, the Taylor series comes in very naturally. With integration, it's not so natural. We need a theorem for that, um, named after the Euler-Maclaurin summation formula. All right, so here I make the point. Um, here we have a very, very slowly converging uh, approximation for an integral. So after more than a million, uh, it takes more than a million uh, function evaluations.
innovations to get close to the machine precision. Um, not a good calculation. Uh, we can do much, much better. And, and you see here, uh, we stopped in the previous example. In the previous example, we stopped here at 257 function evaluations. And we are computing one, by the way. Um, all right, a very good test example. Uh, let's see how we can improve this. Um, all right, uh, so we need uh, error expansion for extrapolation to work. Um, now, what is important uh, for the justification of Romberg integration is that the composite trapezoidal rule has only even powers of each. And we will apply what is called the euler maclaurin summation formula that says that if you are, so we actually are looking at the integral here. So we are looking to integrate uh, a function g. Then uh, you recognize that at the left we have uh, a sum of values, and it's actually quite similar to uh, the trapezoidal rule. So the leftmost and the rightmost point, we only consider half of them. Um, that's because we are using the trapezoidal rule. And then we have this complicated uh, second line. So on the first line, we kind of recognize it's what we would do with the trapezoidal rule in a composite fashion. In the second line, we have this expression for the error that involves all the higher order derivatives of our function g. This will be an important point later on. Uh, in order for everything to work, uh, all these derivatives must exist and they must also be continuous functions. We have to keep that in mind. Uh, that will come important later on. Uh, I will not prove this euler maclaurin summation formula. Um, it's very interesting to do, and I may post a note to this. Uh, but for now, for this lecture, this is a bit outside the scope. What is important is that we understand what is underlined here. Um, it will underline even more, is that uh, if you apply the composite trapezoidal rule to functions that are sufficiently many times continuously differentiable, then the error expansion of the trapezoidal rule involves all the higher order derivatives with the Bernoulli number sitting in there. Very nice, uh, very complicated at this point, not very useful. Well, let us apply this now. Let us try to connect with the trapezoidal rule. Here we have the trapezoidal rule where we apply the coordinate change. Uh, so I started out last lecture saying that numerical integration could be done always between negative one and one. We can always convert interval. Um, so, but here we phrase it still with any interval a and b, and we have to convert to the interval 0 n. So we rewrite the interval 0, but in the integration interval 0 n, we, integ we replace this by the interval a, b, applying this coordinate transformation here. If t goes from 0 to n and and if we want x to go from a to b, then we apply this coordinate transformation here. Uh, so you can see that when t equals 0, x is a. When t equals capital N, then we have n times h, and h is again our step size. So we have the, from calculus, the change of variables in the integrals. You see the one over h popping in already um, in the integral. Um, and why is that important? Because in all the derivatives, we actually will have the h. Uh, so we can actually say that uh, the f of x is h times g. So we have this expression then too for all the higher order derivatives. 
right um I'm sorry, I have to correct. So uh, this is not F is not H times A, um, G. G. Uh, we have the chain rule here. Um, very important, I was forgotten, also the chain rule from calculus. So the fact that uh, we have these relationships at the bottom here is actually because of the chain rule. When we differentiate G, the H comes in. All right then, um, so this is, this slide makes the connection. Let us now apply this connection. Uh, so we now see that if we apply the coordinate change, that what is, what the euler maclaurin formula started with is actually the trapezoidal rule. Um, this is the trapezoidal rule again, but now written with a dot, dot, dot uh, notation. And what is important is that we now have an error formula. So the error formula here involves these Bernoulli numbers. These are constants. Um, everything else is actually also a constant. What is important here is this power of h. And uh, this last uh, term is actually depending on some beta. And there is some beta such that this formula is exact. So we have an exact e e equality. And that depends on the highest, the most highest order of the derivative. But we actually have uh, our expansion now for the error. And I said that it involved only even powers, but it looks like we have only odd powers. Uh, but observe that there is the factor 1 over h here. So we will multiply everything by h. If we multiply everything by h, we will have the exact integral expressed as the trapezoidal rule. So actually, I said we had the trapezoidal rule at uh, the first. This is actually not true. We multiply everything by h. So this gets way. This also gets way here. Uh, we, have, we now have the trapezoidal rule at the left. And we have at the right the exact value plus an error expression. All right, go back to our uh, problem then. Uh, so what I just uh, indicated uh, on the previous slide is that here now uh, abbreviated. So if we are multiplying, if we are multiplying by H, we actually do find the trapezoidal, the composite trapezoidal. And we have all the even powers of H sitting in there. So that is by the application of the euler maclaurin summation formula to our problem of uh, the application of the composite trapezoidal. And that uh, is actually the main uh, point where, how we can get to applying extrapolation. And that is the next slide. Um, so we have encountered extrapolation already when it came to differentiation. So applied in the very, so we, we have the trapezoidal rule that is actually has an error of order. So this is the error, the O to the power H that I indicated earlier. So you see that error coming in again here. So the O term is over here. Now, uh, instead of the O, 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 we are now very interested in the constants. So if we cut the step size in half, the error will be divided by 4. That's important. Um, and we can eliminate by a row reduction, something that we have done already. We take 4 times the more accurate approximation. So we do four times uh, this here, and we subtract. That's kind of, again, an averaging. 
but it's also a role reduction. It is solving a linear system. So it's very similar again to what we did with interpolation. Uh, and here is the formula now. And by this very simple uh, combination, so uh, for these trapezoidal rules, we may have done 257 and 129 function evaluations, but just one divided difference, we actually do have a much more accurate approximation. If our approximation was first 10 to the power minus uh, 2, it will now become 10 to the power minus 4. All right. Um, this can be generalized. Uh, and here you see the general formula for the posit trapezoidal rule. Um, so it's very similar to Neville um, from interpolation. Uh, with Neville, we gave a formal proof uh, by induction. Here, actually, you could also do this. Um, so you can also see that. Uh, we are essentially eliminating. Um, so if you are kind of having doubts about this general formula, I would say do one extra term and you can see how it applies. Uh, and this is the formula for Romberg integration. Uh, so the formula here uh, in the algorithmic format uh, defines Romberg integration which we will now uh, define in a Julia function. So Romberg integration is extrapolation. Here it is coded up by taking in the input of the results of the composite uh, trapezoidal rule. So you see uh, the uh, application here. Um, and here I, I'm not going to 10, uh, so I only want uh, six intervals. Um, so I only want uh, six, not 10. Uh, so the T is then the input for the Romberg. Um, so only one argument. How nice is that? And the algorithm implements the table, the triangular table. Uh, so we start, uh, so we also are actually, um, so we are there, are, there are actually triangular matrices in Julia. I could have exploited this, but uh, we are giving a square matrix back. Um, so but essentially it would be enough with a lower triangular matrix. Uh, the first column is the uh, are the results. So the first column here uh, gives the results from the composite trapezoidal rule and then we do the extrapolation. So we go in rows 2 to n and in columns 2 to i. So you see the triangular structure. We have a ratio that we compute um, and we have the divide difference here. All right, so here you see how this goes. Um, so I picked six uh, 65 function evaluations, and you see that now instead of doing more than a million, I only need 64 function, 65 function evaluations. So the result is actually quite good. You see the elimination also. So this is not a quadratic converging co uh, process uh, still. So there is this uh, hopping of two in each step. So uh, printing out the total error table makes that kind of clear. Um, so uh, what is printed out is the diagonal here. So we have this progression of the errors and we find this on the diagonal here. So I returned the entire uh, table because it's interesting to see the progression of the errors. But again, if you want to be very frugal with your memory, you can organize Romberg integration so that only one vector is 
applied. So the original vector with the uh, trapezoidal approximation is then replaced by the extrapolated values. So in this sense, we can do a lot more efficient uh, integration. So here is the uh, running of the code. Um, so we are applying uh, the composite trapezoidal rule. Um, so you do this for seven, n equals seven. So two to the power seven is 128. And then we apply Romberg integration. All right, I have five minutes left. Uh, so in, in, in a way, you could see this exercise as an approximation for pi, but it's actually quite a lame approximation because you see that pi is already used in the sign. Um, so that's not really good. Um, so instead, let's go back to our original uh, approximation for pi. This is where we... Uh, that was one of the calculations that we did in the last lecture. So the composite trapezoidal rule on this integral here, uh, that's the area of the quarter of the unit circle. Uh, so this will approximate pi over 4, but you need more than a million function evaluations for 10 decimal places. Not a good way to compute pi. All right, um, we are actually not in the business of approximating pi, but we are very much uh, interested in understanding uh, when we can apply a Romberg integration. Uh, when does extrapolation work? Well, I underlined what was important uh, with the euler mclaurin uh, summation theorem. And it is that the function that you integrate must be sufficiently many times continuously differentiable. So uh, if you look at the function, the square root, it looks kind of in rough. But note that the square root, um, if there is one minus uh, x square sitting in there, if we would go past one, and that would already no longer give real values. So one is kind of a very specific uh, value. And it also appears that we have actually a, a problem with the derivatives. Um, so the interval is a closed interval. Uh, so that's what is round, what, what the square bracket here means. All right. It's a, so, and at one, uh, the function is not continuously, uh, sufficiently many times continuously differentiable. So uh, the, the, there is an asymptote there. Uh, the function goes to infinity as x goes to 1. Very bad. So Romberg integration will not be applied. Um, and in some sense, that's a motivation also for uh, the, the next lecture, what should you do with integrals that have at the end uh, problems? And, and this is an integral that has at the end problems. And, but we can fix it. So uh, we will come back to this on Monday. But uh, just as an application, how should you now uh, estimate pi with a simple integral? Well, what you can do is uh, you can say, well, I will use bisect, um, so I divided the unit circle in four. Let's slice it up further. Let's slice it in eight pieces. And then I have the square root of two divided by two. And the square root of two divided by two times itself gives me two. Um, so, or the square is give, gives me one. So th there, is, there is the, I'm sorry, it is actually two. So. So we, we actually do have uh, the, no, we, we have the one. I'm sorry, I'm kind of confused because I'm running out of time. But uh, the, the reformulation of the problem is, uh, let me indicate here, uh, that we are replacing, we are actually computing the area of this. We are applying the uh, trapezoidal rule to this piece now.
And there is no problem with the endpoint if we take uh, the square root of 2 over 2. And that will actually also lead to an approximation of pi. Here you see the Romberg integration. Uh, with 64 subintervals, we get four or five decimal places. With the composite trapezoidal rule, we get more than 10 for the um, Romberg integration. Here uh, you see the um, error table. Um, here is the division by 8, and then we have the 2 that we have to subtract. Um, the 2 now comes from the uh, square that we have cut out of our unit circle. Um, so in the square root over 2 times itself is actually not 1, but it is 1 half. Um, all right, then. Uh, this is quite a speed up, which I point, uh, which I should have pointed out also earlier. So we get much more accuracy with a lot less intervals. Here is another approximation for pi, where you don't need to reformulate the problem, but that's actually the punchline of the exercise. Um, and here I give you a hint. Uh, so the denominator uh, should not have roots in the interval uh, 0, 1. So if uh, this would be a very bad integral to compute if there would be any uh, roots, if, if the denominator would not be, would become 0. Um, and that is not the case. Uh, so actually Romberg integration will apply uh, to this problem. All right, I have run over time. Uh, let me finish with two concluding remarks. So if we want to apply adaptive integration efficiently, we have to use all the information of all previous function evaluations. Uh, trapezoidal rule is better than the midpoint rule, although we will encounter the midpoint rule again in the next lecture. There's uh, a reason why uh, the midpoint rule has this algebraic degree of uh, precision. If you apply Romberg integration, uh, it may give you a tremendous improvements uh, in the slow convergence of the composite trapezoidal rule, but you must take care that you have no bad things happening inside your interval. So we will next time see how what can be done uh, with integrals that have problems at the bounds.